Hey, I'm Robbie Kramer. You're listening to the Leverage Podcast, where we discuss using your social skills to hack dating, travel, finding your dream job, and becoming a complete man. Hey, everybody. We're back with Dr. Robert Glover, who's the author of No More Mr. Nice Guy, a proven plan for getting what you, for getting what you want in love, sex, and life. And Dr. Robert Glover has helped thousands of nice guys transform from being passive, resentful victims to empowered, integrated males. Along with these personal changes have come similar transformations in these men's professional careers and intimate relationships. And I'm very excited to have him on because he was one of the first authors I read in my personal growth about 12 years ago. So welcome to the show, Robert. Robbie, good to have you. uh, Good to be with you. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell us your story. Give us a background. Um, and I'm, I'm super curious to, to hear from you because like I said, like, I think I first read the book, the game way back Mm -hmm. in 2005, 2006 or something. That was my introduction into this whole world, but your book was the first, you know, normal mainstream book that I read and it really changed my life. So looking forward to, to hearing all about it and your story. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, here, here's, I'm, I've never told this story before. You're the first person to ask me. Um, all right. That's, that's, a, that's a joke. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I tell people, you know, I'm a recovering nice guy. And, you know, if you had met me 30 years ago, I, I would have told you, I'm, I'm a nice guy. I'm one of the nicest guys you ever want to meet. And I, I couldn't understand why everybody didn't have that attitude. You know, why everybody wasn't considerate towards others and why everybody wasn't generous and caring and, and things like that. And, um, you know, I thought that'd be a good way to be. And I I was trying to be different from my father, who was kind of a self-centered, selfish, uh, could be a jerk, uh, could be very critical and demeaning. And my mother even told me as a boy that she was raising my brother and I to be different from our father, i.e. to be nice, Um, Mm -hmm. because my dad wasn't always so nice. And, and, you know, I also grew up in the 60s and 70s, um, hearing the angry feminism and, and, you know, women... Uh, railing against men, kind of like they're doing now with, you know, the hashtag Me Too uh, movement. And, you know, I, so I, I thought, I don't want to be one of those bad men. I don't want to be those kind of guys that, you know, o- only want sex with women, you know, that treat them badly. I, I don't want to be one of those jerks. And um, so I, you know, I worked really hard to, to be a good guy. I grew up in a fundamental Christian church that I'm sure that fed into it as well. Be a good guy, be a good guy. Uh, and, and we're all that kind of took a hit, um, was in my second marriage. And um, a a couple years into the marriage, my wife basically confronted me and said, hey, I'm tired of your passive aggressiveness. I'd rather be with a jerk. You know, you say you're a nice guy. Everybody thinks you're a nice guy, but you treat me badly. And, and, you know, you'll, you'll treat me well, you treat me well. And then like, you know, then, then, then you'll say something hurtful or you'll do something mean to me. And she goes, you, you've, you've got to go get some therapy. You got to go work on this or I'm leaving. And uh, I, I didn't want her to leave, even though I thought, well, why isn't me being a nice guy make her treat me better? And I thought, if, if there's a problem here, you're the problem because you're <laughs> angry all the time. You never want to have sex anymore. You're critical. You're moody. You're unhappy. Uh, I thought, okay, I'll go to therapy. And, you know, I thought, I'll go find out why me being a nice guy doesn't make her appreciate me more or want to have sex. And, and uh, luckily, I got into some good programs. I actually started in a 12-step group for sex addicts, and I quickly found out I wasn't a sex addict. I, I wasn't having enough sex to be a sex addict because my <laughs> wife never wanted to have sex anymore. But for the, it was really empowering because for the first time in my life, I started just revealing me, just like putting me out there, you know, every, every dark thing, every every behavior, past, present, every thought, every impulse, I started opening up and like, man, that was liberating because kind of growing up, trying to be, you know, mama's good boy, trying to be not like the bad men, the feminists complained about, trying to be the good Christian, trying, you know, just for everything was trying to be good. It's kind of like, wow, this is cool. I can talk about where I'm not so good, where I'm bad, where I've thought things, where I've done things. Yeah, liberating. And uh, it was liberating. You know, this 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 meeting, I think, started like six o'clock in the morning once a week. And I actually was excited about going every week. And, you know, there were, there were some hardcore guys in there that really had some pretty big, you know, sex-related problems in their life. You know, just 
bad behaviors they couldn't quit doing. And they probably all thought, why are you here? But it was great because I, 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 I got to reveal me. And around that same time, I started working with, with a therapist, um, started learning about things like about boundaries. And here I was in my 30s in my second marriage and already had a PhD in marriage and family therapy. And I'd never heard of boundaries before. So I learned how you had to have personal boundaries, how to say no, how to ask for what you want, how to start making your needs a priority. And then around a little while later, I, I joined a men's group um, that was focusing a lot around sexuality, but just around masculine empowerment led by a woman um, that was really good. Uh, she, she, she liked men. And so that was really good for me to like be around you know, a powerful woman that actually liked, you know, how men are. It's okay to be a guy. It's okay to be a man. So I was in that men's group probably four or five years. Um, And then since that time, I've done other kind of therapy and coaching. I'm in a men's program now uh, that I participate in. So what happened was when I started, you know, looking at my own, why do I think I have to be a good guy? Why do I think I have to be different from other men? And it really came down to a core belief that I didn't think I was okay just as I was. And so I thought I had to either become what other people wanted me to be and hide whatever I thought might cause them to reject me or or react negatively to me. Now, as I was really kind of getting these insights about myself, Uh, I I was working as a marriage and family therapist, and I started noticing that uh, a a lot of the couples coming to to work with me, guys with their girlfriends, guys with their wives, these men were saying the exact same things I had been saying and thinking and feeling. You know, they're saying, I'm a good guy. I'm the nicest guy you ever want to meet. I treat her better than her ex. I'm raising her kids. I give her everything she wants. You know, I, I make all these sacrifices. It's never enough. She's never happy. When's it going to be my turn? How come she's always angry? How come she never wants to have sex anymore? And, you know, I could finish these guys' sentences for them. I, I, I thought, wow, I'm not the only one who has this dynamic with women and then bigger picture in life in general, but it, it seemed to really be showing up in men's relationships. Um, and then there's also, you know, a few single guys here and there that would say, you know, I'm a nice guy, but how come women don't want to date me? How come, you know, maybe they go out with me once and then say, let's just be friends. Or how come they tell me you are such a great guy. Some woman is going to be so lucky to have you. And, but how come they don't want me? <laughs> how come that woman right. doesn't want me? She thinks some other <laughs> some woman other would be lucky. Yeah. <laughs> some other woman would be lucky to have me, but not her. Um, mm-hmm. and, and they couldn't understand why being nice didn't attract women or make the women want to be with them, even though the women all say, I want a nice guy, you know, right. but, but then, then they go hang out with the jerks and, you know, the guys don't <laughs> understand that. So from the, this men I was working with, I said, all right, uh, I'm going to start a, a men's group. We'll meet every other Wednesday. Um, and I just started writing some chapters, I guess we might call them blog articles. Now that was before blogging. And I just started writing. I wrote every Wednesday and every other week when we met, I'd give them stuff that I was learning about nice guys, how, you know, mm-hmm. why we get to be that way, what our thinking is, how, what doesn't work, what works better. And I just kept writing and, and the guys in my groups. And, and then soon I had a second group and their wives and girlfriends were saying, you need to write a book. You need to go on Oprah. You know, there's lots of men that need this information. So over a period of about seven years, I, I, the book evolved and finally got published um, in two, early 2003, came out in, in print addiction, edition, so you probably found it not too long after that. Um, mm-hmm. And it continues to do well. The, the sales and royalties have gone up, continue to go up every year. So um, it, it seems to really be making an impact worldwide. So that's, that's my story of, of how I kind of got confronted with this stuff and how it turned into the book, No More Mr. Nice Guy. Yeah, it's, it's so cool to hear. Um, I have a men's group that I run also. And the first the first required book that they have to read when they come to the program is your book, because basically everyone has the nice guy syndrome that, that joins that group. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, almost every guy I interview with like you or, or, you know, does coaching, pretty much they all say, yeah, your book's at the top of my required reading list. And, and you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Not, not, not only because, you know, it, it you know, sells books and pays me royalties. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's nice to know that something that, that, that 
I started working on years ago with no idea that it was going to be a book. I didn't set out to write a book. It's nice to know that it's actually now kind of part of a, of a worldwide kind of awakening and revolution for men. Where, where yeah. men I, I really see that worldwide, there's, there's not a formal movement, but I see uh, this movement of men seeking tribe, seeking connection with other men. They may go seek it through pickup. They may go seek it through 12 step groups. They may go seek it through mankind project. They may go seek it through uh, divorce recovery groups. Um, but men are seeking connection with men and, and whether they know it or not, I think we're seeking tribe and we come at it from a lot of different ways. And, and it's cool to know that, that, you know, my book, is often a part of, of what's happening there. Yeah, it's definitely a big part of it. And I totally agree with the, the tribe phenomenon. And I know, you know, before I found the, uh, the pickup community, which was my entrance into this sort of like tribe of men, um, I always felt like there was a big piece kind of lacking. You know, I, mm -hmm. I wasn't comfortable expressing myself to other guys. I'd play golf and hang out with my friends, but we never talk about our feelings. We never talk about stuff that really mattered. We didn't even talk about, about girls. It was just like, oh yeah, you know, a little bit here and there. Um, but, you know, when I found the, the dating community, it allowed me to kind of have that liberation that you mentioned where I could actually talk to people about what was going on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, prior to that, I just felt like I was alone in this whole thing. So, and it's interesting when I talk to guys that, you know, that have learned and gotten good at pickup. And, you know, um, I, I, I've recently published another book, Dating Essentials for Men, and I, and I call it the Unpickup Guide to Dating Success. Um, yeah, like the title. When, 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 when I talk with guys, you know, that are good at pickup, most of them, what they tell me is kind of once you get over all your fears and anxieties of approaching women and talking to women and, you know, wh how, whatever your pickup style is, what most of the guys tell me, you know, but the thing they like most about it is that they're going out with their buddies, you know, to, to, pra to practice, you know, they're sure. going out to pick up women. You know, I got quotes going on, but the real <laughs> thing is they're going out to have a good time with their buddies. Yeah. Um, and, and so it is still very tribal. Um, even though it, it began with, I don't know how to talk to women. I don't know how to get laid. And it turns out being, I'm going to go out with my friends tonight and you know, we're, we're, we're going to go, you know, open sets. We're going to go do whatever it is we do, right. but we're doing it together. And it took a bunch of loners who didn't have any guy friends and uh -huh. gave them this community, which is really cool. Like a lot of, you know, a lot of guys who were I don't know, misfits, if you want to call them that, or I mean, I kind of was as well. Um, just guys that like didn't really fit together and it gave them this common tribe really to, to hang out with, which is super cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to hear. It's interesting. So you started with a 12 step program. Um, a friend of mine actually, told me I needed to go to that not too long ago because of my uh, sex addiction um, or, you know, this, these were his words, not mine, but <laughs> I don't think I have a sex addiction either, but uh, that's a, that's a different rabbit hole. Uh, but, you know, there was no, from, you know, what I've, what I, this is a guess, but was there any sort of community or anyone else really talking about this stuff back in the day? Cause it seems like you had to pioneer a lot of it. You know, when, you know, I, I tell people this when, when I started my, my own, you know, personal recovery, my own nice guy, uh, recovery, self-improvement, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, I was about 25 years ago and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I started through 12 step group cause that's was the, the easiest thing to find. Um, and as I said, even though I, I found out I wasn't a, a sex addict, I, I, I kept going because it was all men in this group. So that, that was uh, fortuitous because uh, I realized I needed to connect with men. I, I, I was often more comfortable with women. Any event I went to, I kind of tended to hang out more with the women than the men. So, so that, that was really uh, a good process for me. Now, around that time, there was a, kind of a growing uh, men's movement based really on the mythopoetic work of Joseph Campbell, Robert Bly, Michael Mead. Um, and, and I went to some programs like that as well. And, you know, they kind of had that model of, of, you know, kind of reinitiating the masculine initiation, the hero's journey uh, of, of, you know, dealing with difficult things and, and conquering them and growing and, you know, evolving as men. And, and that, that, that had some influence on me. 
but in a lot of ways, it, it never resonated deeply with me. You know, I'd go to some meetings and, you know, you sit in a men's circle and you got a talking stick and, you know, whoever has the stick can stand up and talk. And then everybody says, Oh, you know, when they're done and, um, and, you know, but just kind of going out in the woods and beating on drums and stuff like that didn't really resonate with me. I would probably enjoy it more now than, than I did like <laughs> at that time in my early thirties. Right. Um, but that, that was kind of the foundation. That's, that's where really, that, that, that's our forefathers. That's where this, this stuff began. I call that kind of first generation men's movement. You know, the Robert Bly, Joseph Campbell, um, maybe Jungian, you know, Jung even started a lot of this stuff, very shadow work, looking at our dark side, archetypes, yeah. stuff like that. Um, and, and then I would consider myself kind of more in the second generation, second tier. Uh, I didn't know that's what I was. But but now that you know, there's other books that have been written. Um, Waves for Your Man by David Data. Yeah, it came out a little came out a little bit before my book. I didn't mm -hmm. actually find that book till after my book was published. Mm. A lot of guys kept my clients. Hey, you got to read this book. You know, Waves for Your Man, David Data. And I thought, well, that's kind of a weird name and a weird title for a book. And for whatever reason, <laughs> I, I didn't read it till after my book was published. I I'd gotten divorced a second time. I was starting to date, and I remember picking it up and reading it and telling a woman I was dating, "This book's my new Bible. This book is great." Right. <laughs> I said, "It's a great companion book for No More Mister Nice Guy." And it when, really is. Yeah. When men tell me when I like do interviews and they say, "Yeah, there's two books I recommend." I know. <laughs> I know they're going to say mine and out of my mouth next. Yep. Wait, wait, the superior man. They're great. They're very different books. Um, you know, I've been to a couple of workshops with data over the years. Uh, the coach I work with now is somebody who's trained with data for 10 years. Um, so I, I don't know that I buy hundred percent, you know, it's a model that is helpful. That's helpful for us guys. So I didn't find that till after I'd done a lot of my own recovery. And then mm -hmm. with the with the internet, man, this, this shit's just blown up in terms of men yeah. being able to find good advice. And then I read the game as well um, after my second divorce, and I was single in my late forties and hadn't ever really dated very well. And the game kind of pointed me in the direction of, oh, there are ways that you can talk to women. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and like I said, I never really fell into pickup, but the game and then a lot of the early stuff coming out of pickup was helpful in terms of me getting out of my comfort zone and starting to connect uh, more authentically with women. And one of the cool things I've watched over the years about pickup, because that is, really is a strong part of the men's movement, is that most of the pickup guys have matured. You know, they, yeah. they, they now talk more about being authentic, about building a relationship, you know, whereas before it was just like scoring, you know, how, how many models can I get their phone number? You know, that was kind of it. I got a number. I scored. No, no you didn't really score anything. <laughs> you know, um, you got a phone number from somebody who's not going to call you back. Um, right. But, you know, it, that's matured a lot. And, and, and that's been cool to see. So there's been, you know, a few layers to the, this whole thing, you know, for men's movement and. Um, it, there's so many different flavors to it out there. And there's so many ways men can, can kind of come into the tribe. But no, when I started really about all there was, was 12 step. And I think actually mankind project existed at that time. There was Sterling weekend, which I've never done, but I didn't mm -hmm. do the mankind project till a year and a half ago. That's the first time I've ever done a new warrior uh, adventure. Um, That's, so I've was, heard of the Sterling. I, I think I've heard of the Sterling men's group. But I, I've never heard of Mankind Project. Okay, Mankind Project is is a program, kind of it's an initiation, it's a weekend, where um, they they really recreate the whole Joseph Campbell hero's journey, weave in a lot of Robert Bly. Um, the warrior training, similar thing? Yeah, or? that's what it is. It's okay. a new warrior adventure. And Mankind okay. Project, I think, has Maybe I two different yeah. programs. But the, the new warrior adventure is the weekend program that's kind of around initiation. Um, and, and one thing that's really good about that program is they have really good follow-up. They have their I groups where, you know, you continue to meet with men in your local area after you've done the program. And to me, that's just really cool because that's, that's one thing that we men just don't tend to have is that regular connection to go connect. And uh, you and I were talking before we started recording, you know, you're, you went from San Diego to the Ukraine. I went from Seattle. I live in Mexico, uh, living down here. I'm married to a Mexican woman. Uh, she doesn't speak English. My stepkids don't speak English. <laughs> so I'm immersed in, in the Mexican culture, speaking Spanish. And my Spanish has gotten a lot better, but it's not good enough 
to have like a lot of buddies and guy friends down here. And, you know, at the age I'm at culturally, you know, I don't want to just go out and hang out with buddies, you know, drinking and, you know, it's just not what I do. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I actually, a year and a half ago, got into another men's program where we have three work retreats a year. We, we, we connect online. Um, it's got guys all over the world in it. And that's just been so empowering is, is, you know, married again for the third time It's helped my marriage It's helped my business It's helped my, my book writing. And so, man, we've just kind of circled back to it again, but I'm just such a fan of, of men being able to find so many programs. Now there are so many men's coaches out there now. I mean, just, just Google men's coach. On, on, yeah. Uh, and, well, clearly there's a huge need for it because exactly. You know, it's, it's definitely an underserved market, even as it is. I mean, I would guess still maybe 5% and percent men, you know, ever even stumble across this sort of literature. I, yeah. I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm being too conservative on that number, but I mean, it's, it's such an important thing that I think most guys are totally missing out on and maybe in different cultures, um, you know, there is more of a connection there. I, I, from most of the guys who grew up in South America and more the, the Latin cultures or Spain, France, Italy, they tend to have like a stronger male connection. But then when you right. go to the colder climate countries, especially up in, you know, Scandinavia, like there is, it's just considered weird to like talk about anything uh, personal with okay. guys. So you, that's you been know. your travel experience. And, and yeah, I, I don't, I don't travel around as much as you. Um, but one thing I have known I've seen is that, um, my book's translated into several languages, but even just the, e I, I get emails from guys all over the world all the time. I mean, from every part of the world. Um, and so, you know, that the, the, both the, kind of the whole nice guy pattern and just that need for masculine connection. Most nowadays, most boys, most adult men didn't grow up feeling connected to their fathers, didn't have any kind of masculine initiation, grew up you know, usually in school systems with female teachers, grew up trying to please mom, trying to please the, our women teachers. And we're, we're, we're just disconnected from that, that masculine dynamic. And I'm convinced as men, we need it to have good relationships with women. We need it to succeed in life. We need it. Um, if you look back at any part of human history, the men hung out with the men. If you go back to our yeah. tribal times for a million and a half to two million years, the men hung out with men. The men were hunters and gatherers. They went out, they gathered, they hunted, they fought, they came back, uh, and the women hung out with the women. Um, for, once we got to more of an uh, agrarian, agricultural-based um, existence for about the last 10,000 years or so, um, still, the men hung out with men. The men went out and worked in the field. And, and if you just even look back to about 200 years ago, you, you know, even back to you know, around the time of the Industrial Re Revolution, it really wasn't until about World War II that women entered the workforce, men and women worked together. And then you know, in the 50s, at least in the US, that's when kind of we started having this more of idea of, of men and women having shared roles you know, in the home as husband and wife, as parents, and kind of things being more 50-50 in terms of household and economic earning power. And um, so it's probably only been since like the like 1950s that men quit hanging out almost exclusively with men. Men didn't hang around women. It just isn't what we did. And the women, mm -hmm. you know, were tended to be hanging around with women. Now, I'm not saying we should go back, you know, where the men, you know, are just, and the women stay at <laughs> home and cook and raise the kids. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about is in our human DNA. It's in our male DNA to be connected, to work, to accomplish, to play, to fuck around with men. It's just there. And so much of culture over the last, let's say, 70 years has kind of splintered that. And again, that kind of brings us back to that looking for tribe. We don't know that's what we're looking for. We think we want to learn how to get laid, but really right. we're looking for tribe. You know, <laughs> right. we think we want to recover from divorce. We, want, we think we want to quit drinking. But the truth is we're looking for tribe. And yep. it's in tribe that we learn to succeed at those things. Yeah, that's very well put. It's funny. All those things we're do look try it's true um and that was you know my experience growing up was um i had 
two little sisters and my mom was a, you know, stay at home mom. So I spent most of my time with them and my dad is a, a doctor. So he spent long hours at the office and, um, you know, he was, he was a, an awesome role model, but he wasn't the most like, like masculine guy ever. And my mom was, you know, pretty like aggressive, you know, Jewish mom, pretty dominant. And, uh, you know, she raised me to be a nice mensch, a nice Jewish boy. And there you go, you know, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, my dad just basically did whatever she said. Um, not that he was really a pushover or anything, but you know, he, he just kind of did his own thing. So yeah. kind of that whole, whole happy wife, happy life, you know, yeah. um, you know, if, ma <laughs> if mama ain't happy, nobody ain't happy. Um, yeah, and that's how a lot of us men grew up is that, you know, okay. You know, like one of the things I often say is that like, it, you know, as, as we grow up with, you know, our mothers, female preschool teachers, female elementary school teachers, you know, learning to graduate from third grade to fourth grade as little boys, not only involves learning the reading, writing, and arithmetic, but how to please a woman, you know, totally. to, to succeed yeah. in school as a little boy, yeah, learn how to please women. Uh, unfortunately, um, the ways we try to figure out how to please women actually usually don't work. Um, right. <laughs> maybe, maybe one of the reasons is, is maybe many of these women can't be pleased. Um, but the, the things we think that we're doing to please them actually just make us these passive, you know, little boys. And here we are as adults, you know, trying to get our needs met as, as still being those passively pleasing little boys. Um, right. And, and again, a lot of that's because we didn't have men to show us how, 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 to, how to function and penetrate the world in, in you know, powerful ways. Yeah, and um, I'm curious because you said you're growing up, your father was kind of the, a little bit opposite of that in a sense, more of like an aggressive, you know, dominating guy, which made you kind of go the opposite way. Is that right? You know, it's interesting. As I've gotten older, I keep seeing my father in – through different eyes, I guess is, is the best way to put it. Uh -huh. um, and he's been dead for 10 years. Um, but even now, my, my vision of him keeps evolving, even though he's been dead <laughs> for 10 years. You know, my father, like your dad, my dad had some really good traits. He was a hard worker, kind of blue collar, worked at the post office, um, you know, did that his entire life. Um, it was, he hated his job. But he went and did it because that's what men did. They supported mm -hmm. their family. It let him get, get off work like at 3.30 in the afternoon. So he probably came to every single ball practice I had as a kid. Baseball, football, soccer. You know, came to so many of my games. Um, he valued that. And so he was there. He took our family camping, took me fishing. Um, so I did have a, a, a good connection with my dad in those ways. And in many ways, he was kind of like more the, the, the woman in the family he's, because he was mm -hmm. moody, um, <laughs> you know, he, you know, was good mood one minute, you know, angry, critical the next minute, walking on eggshells. But looking back, I think my father was also probably the more affectionate, uh, you know, in the family, even though I don't think any of us kids went to my dad for nurturing per se. Usually if you wanted anything from my dad, the first answer he'd give was no. So we'd always go to mom because, you know, she, she was codependent and, you know, wanted to, wanted everybody to like her. And so she'd try to make us happy, but my mother's still alive. And, you know, looking back and just seeing the relationship with her now, um, she's not at all affectionate. Um, she'll only say, I love you. If I say it first, um, I, I, I every time around her, I, I hug on her a lot and she hugs back, but she never initiates hugs. She never gives praise. Now she'll brag about me to all of her friends, whatever I accomplished, but she'll never, <laughs> never say to me, <laughs> good job. And I right. look back, it was always that way. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's easier for her to give constructive criticism than it is to give praise. So looking back at my dad, even though a lot of times I saw my dad through my mother's eyes, you know, we all would sit around and commiserate about how dad was so mean and hurtful and blah, 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 because that's how my mom saw him. And, and actually, when I was in my mid-30s and kind of starting to do my work, I started and learned about boundaries. <laughs> I, I started setting boundaries with my mother because, you know, she'd, I'd talk to her on the phone. And every time I talked, she'd want to complain about my dad. And I mm -hmm. said, OK, mom, since I was a little kid, that's been my job is listening to you complain about dad. I don't want to. He's my dad. You know, I, I, I want to see him for who he is. I know he's not perfect. You and I can talk about anything else. Just don't want to talk about dad. And it's like, she just like, every time I talk to her, she still complain about my father. Every, you know, every phone call, every time around. And I said, mom, no. And, and, and like, 
she didn't deal well with me setting boundaries. And I ended up not talking to my parents for 15 years, mainly because I started telling my mother, I'm not going to listen to you complain about my dad. You're still married to him. He's your husband. Deal with whatever your issues are. But so as a little kid, I saw dad through my mother's eyes. And, and again, didn't want to be that, what I saw as selfish, critical, you know, all about me, you know, boss everybody around, you know, double standard, the rules don't apply to him, but you know, that he imposes on everybody else. And, you know, as I've gotten older, I, I see a lot of his, of his really good qualities as a man. And I see his flaws, his, his woundings. I don't know that I completely understand, you know, what his moods were about. Um, but, but I have a softer view of him than I did as yeah. a kid. And, and mainly because I'm not viewing him through a woman's eyes, through my mother's eyes. And I've just come to see him that he was a very flawed human being um, who was well liked by a lot of people, people that I wasn't usually around, his, his, his coworkers and, and people that he knew through hobbies liked him. And I um, thought, wow, he's kind of at his funeral. You know, people came and talked about him. And I thought, wow, they knew a different guy than I did as a kid. Hmm. So, yeah, I don't know where all of this is going, but this is just father work that I've done over the years. And, and again, yeah. I think it's, it's a crucial part of what we men have to do to embrace our own masculinity, to get comfortable with our own selves as, 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 as you know, masculine creatures, but to also, I think, to connect well with women. We've got to do our dad work and our men work yeah in order to connect well with, with women, you know, and that's where like, I think guys that just want to, you know, maybe they've, they've spent their entire life, you know, playing Dungeons and Dragons and video games and World of Warcraft and searching for porn on the internet, watching television. And then they think, but I want, I want this instant magical thing that'll make women, you know, want to be with me and have sex with me. And I'll go, yeah, <laughs> yeah getting, real, good getting real good at WoW and D and D is not going to turn on that many women. But right. And I tell them, you know, you got to get out and become a social animal and you got to get out and learn how to connect with men. There's just something about that masculine vibe between men that just naturally attracts women. It, just, it turns women on and, and, you know, you don't have to, you know, go practice, have a clever pickup line. Women actually start coming to you when they see that magnetic connection you have with other men. Yeah. When they see two or not two, but a group of, of guys together, and then they see you as a leader of men. There's nothing more attractive than that. That's big turn. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's so fascinating what you said about seeing your dad through your mother's eyes and, um, you know, creating those boundaries where, you know, you were able to kind of transform that, that, you know, jaded or skewed vision, uh, if you will, of that. And um, I'm sure that's super common uh, for guys out there. Luckily for me, my mom never really complained about my dad too much other than the fact that he worked a lot, but yeah. you know, that wasn't really a bad thing. Um, but I, I, I'm sure there's so many guys there that are probably, you know, eventually listening to this and thinking, oh, wow, I might have this kind of totally, you know, fucked up view of, of my dad because of my mom, because it's just so normal in our culture for men to, or for women to beat up on men. It's just like the, the total well, and I agree with you. And let's take it a step further because this is something I've been thinking about recently. Um, and, and yeah, one thing talking about our, our view of our dads, Robert Bly in, in Iron John, one of the things that really stood out about that book it, for me was, again, the, the, we got to reconnect with, with, with our fathers and, and with kind of the hairy man within us. And mm -hmm. he makes a statement that none of our fathers were near as good as we want to make them or near as bad as we want to make. And so basically we got to get dad either off the pedestal or out of the <laughs> right. And because we can't relate to our own masculinity or to other men if we've got this skewed vision of our father. Now, I, here's the thing I've been thinking about. Um, and, you know, this is something that, that I'd kind of saw when I was really beginning my own nice guy work is, and working with a lot of nice guys, but I'm really seeing it again. And it's still, I think, part of the kind of this men's movement that, that I'm seeing it, you know, is – the, pro the program I'm in is, is a program you know, for, for, quote, embodied men. It's about men developing deeper consciousness, being more present, more powerful in, in you know, very positive kind of ways. But one of the things I'm seeing for a lot of, of these men's coaches that kind of lean in that direction, and a lot of it comes out of the David Data lineage, which, like I said, I'm a fan, but I don't agree with every bit of it. 
there's almost this thing that kind of like says we're different we're embodied we're conscious we're present we're respectful of the feminine and it's almost as if it's kind of a second wave of nice guyism yeah that, and it's kind of like a nice guy needs there to be an enemy out there a bad guy the jerks that women complain about. So even coming at kind of like with the whole hashtag Me Too movement of kind of the, the regurgitation of the, oh, the patriarch or patriarchy is, you know, terrible to women, blah, blah, blah. And, and yes, men have done terrible things to women and women have done terrible things to men and women and men have co-created a lot of the systems that are out there. It's not this thing that men have imposed on women. Patriarchy probably has done more damage to men than, than it does to, right. than it has to women. <laughs> And, and, so, yeah. and you, you, there, there's, there's evidence to support that. As I'm not being dismissive of men hurt, being hurtful to women. It's happened since you know, day one. But initially, men were providers and protectors for women. Mm -hmm. And what has happened, though, I think there's a certain unconscious energetic dynamic going on. And I see it in nice guys. I see it in kind of in this embodied men's movement that almost needs there to be a patriarchy that exists, that there's this class of men that hurt women. That's why women, you know, have the, the whole hashtag me too, because women have been so hurt and abused by men. And then like we men, we good guys are going to come rescue them from that we're going to come heal, help heal their right. wounds we're going to be the good guys because we're like embodied knight, right? we're conscious or, or <laughs> it, you know they in the red yeah. pill community they call it captain save a ho um, right but is and, that different than the white knight cuck or is it the same guy i don't know <laughs> but 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 what it is it's like it's like it's the needing to have the villain out there so we can be that white knight so that we can yeah. So we can save the hoe because, hey, look, I'm, I'm different. I'm not right. that bad man. Now, the thing is, I tell men, we are probably more like our fathers than different. We are probably more like all those, quote, bad men out there than different. We hurt women, too. We go unconscious, too. But by needing there to be this enemy, these bad men out there, to, for us to have a sense of identity that we believe will make us valuable and attractive to women, all that, all I see that happening is us still staying stuck in a role and not fully yeah. embracing who we are as men. And I see it attracting a lot of wounded women, you know, with the promise of, oh, I'll be different. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get you through, you know, all those things the bad men did to you. And in my experience, because I tend to be one of those guys that attracts the wounded women, they never actually do seem to get through all their complaint about the bad things that men did. And then I often end up on their list of men they're complaining about at some <laughs> point in time, because that just seems to be their nature is, is to see themselves as victim and, and to want to complain. So I guess right. my, my point is, um, as men, l let's, be, let's be cautious of needing to create a dichotomy of, of masculinity, that there's these dark, toxic males out there, toxic masculinity. We're different than, from that. We're not toxic to women. Yeah, we're fucking toxic to women. Um, yeah. And well, just like they're toxic to us. We, 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 if, if, yeah. we're, if we're making that dichotomy, it, we don't ever actually get to see how we are indeed toxic to women and how we are indeed do have a dark side and how we do indeed do hurtful things. Um, well, one of the, it was, it was so interesting. Uh, uh, one of the speeches at the 21 convention I was mentioning to you that I just spoke at, I know you were a speaker as well earlier this year, um, a guy by the name of Richard Bran uh, Grannon spoke. And the, the point of his speech, he was trying to prove that the most, the, the biggest perpetrators of toxic masculinity right now is actually women. And um, it was, was fascinating the way he described this whole thing. And I, I I mean, I'm not going to be able to <laughs> to prove his his point because he got into Carl Jung and Yin and Yang and all these very yeah. interesting, um, you know, both uh, scientific and spiritual studies of why that's the case. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, by the end, I was like, wow, he's totally right. There are so many women out there, are, you know, running toxic masculine energy more so than I think a lot of men. And, uh, and yeah, I I I, I see. I see also, basically, you know, I, I, in the work I do with, with when I work, I work mainly with men now, but, you know, I've worked a lot with men and women. And I want to ask you if you worked with women. Yeah, I, I, I did for years. When I first started my, my counseling practice, it was primarily women coming to me. 
And, mm -hmm. and then as a marriage counselor, you know, the, often they were coming and bringing their husbands with them, but it was the women dragging their husbands in, or, or boyfriends into counseling. By the time I, I, I quit doing private practice uh, six, seven years ago to, to live more full time in Mexico and moved my business online, most of the couples counseling I was doing was the men dragging the women into counseling because the, the, the men had become much more conscious about relationship and much more sensitive about wanting to get their needs met from these kind of hard, you know, complaining, unhappy women that, you know, just wanted to be unhappy and complain. And, you know, when I break down masculine, feminine energies, and, you know, I, I try not to do this just by, okay, you're male, so you're masculine, you're female, you're feminine. Majority of men I work with, the nice guys, fall into what I call lower feminine, i.e., you know, we're seeking validation and approval. We, we get our feelings hurt easily. Um, we feel victimized. We take things personally. We withdraw. We pout. I call those lower feminine behaviors, but I see so many men down there in that, that lower quadrant. Now, yeah. over the other side of the page, the lower masculine is unconscious masculine behavior. Some people will call that toxic masculine. It's the aggressiveness. It's the control. It's the dominance. It's the destruction. And yes, because so many of the men I see are in the lower feminine, because of polarity of dynamic of relationship, they tend to attract women that operate mostly in their lower masculine. And that yeah. probably we would call that toxic masculine, the dominance, the control, the aggressiveness, the hurtfulness. And um, there's just been a whole societal switch from right. you know, those, <laughs> those energies. Yeah. And when you come to Ukraine and probably, you know, Mexico, it, it's not like that at all. And it, it's so refreshing because it's very rare that you, you see that energy. You know, the, most of the guys, if you see toxic masculinity, it's from, you know, the dudes. <laughs> and if you see, uh, and you just don't see the, the craziness that, you know, you step off the plane in New York City and it's just everywhere. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I was just in New York three weeks ago. Yeah, you see everything in New York City. I love it. Um, and, and, you know, but there's even, uh, you mentioned cultural dynamic. Um, there, there's an interesting piece here in, in, in a Latin American culture where I live, is that, you know, we hear the macho culture, um, mm -hmm. kind of the, the, the masculine dominant. Here's the funny thing about m macho culture. Macho culture, macho, a macho man is really a mama's boy. That's just, there's no other way to put yeah. it. He's a mama. Yeah, they're always just like a kind of a big pussy in disguise, right? They're, they're like the bully in a sense, or maybe not <sighs> the, the wrong word, but they, the, underneath the machismo is kind of like an insecure guy who's seeking validation a lot, I think. And, and here's how that gets created. It, it's twofold. The, the mothers and fathers contribute to it, often because the dads are not particularly involved in the parenting because they're out being macho. They're, they're out, you know, <laughs> chasing other women and drinking with their buddies and, and you know, you know fucking the putas. Um, right. and, and the women are at home raising the kids and, you, you know, typical big family. That's really changed a lot in recent years here in, in Mexico, at least, but probably most of Latin America. But what happens is the mothers raise their boys to like be the prince. They're, they're the king of the family. And they raise their girls to wait on their brothers, to, to bring them their food, to clean their rooms, to, to do the, the, the boys are raised as if they can do no wrong because the women who have very little status in Latin culture get status by having a boy, by having mm -hmm. boys. And then kind of like the boys praise their mothers. They, 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 but actually like can leave their mothers to starve to death in old age, but, Oh, you know, I love my mother. <laughs> But so what happens is the mothers raising their sons to expect that the whole purpose of women is to take care of them and meet their needs. And the girls are raised, you know, with that same mentality, you know, go take care of your man while he treats you badly and has no accountability and expectation. So the whole macho culture, I put at the feet of the mothers is the mothers raising their boys to expect that they, they, they have no accountability, but, and women are there to, to just give them whatever they want. And I was, um, I had this kind of aha moment. I, I was in a, a town called um, Guanajuato. Uh, it's in central Mexico near Leon. And it's an old colonial um, silver mining town. It, it was, at one time, they called it New Spain, New España, Nueva España, because the Spanish came there and basically worked the local Mexicans to death in the silver mines and sent the silver back to, to Spain. And uh, it's a colonial town, beautiful, beautiful colonial town with like a cathedral 
pretty much on every street corner. I mean, big old, you know, several hundred year old cathedrals. And I was standing in one of these w with my wife, who of course is Catholic growing up here in Mexico. And I was standing in the back and like right, in, right next to each other, kind of in the back, they, they didn't plan it this way, but where I was standing, there was um, uh, a, a big kind of like a statue of, of Jesus on a cross, you know, kind of hanging on a, a big pillar or post. And right near that, was a big painting, a big picture of, of here they call it the, the Virgin Guadalupe, it's Mother Mary. Um, so, so here was Mother Mary right next to the Jesus on the cross. And it hit me that all the little boys in this culture are Jesus. You know, they're, they're, they're Jesus, they're so perfect, they're amazing. And all the women are, are the mother, Mother Mary, you know, the, the Virgin Guadalupe, that, you know, it just sacrifices all of herself to, to you know, the Jesus. And it's a cultural mm -hmm. dynamic. But here's the other interesting thing, is that this macho culture produces the very visible macho men, but it also produces tons of nice guys. Because whenever you have kind of this either aggressive or, dom or macho male culture, often a lot of boys grow up trying to be the opposite. I mean, that, that happened to me. I grew up to be the opposite of that. So not only in macho culture do you see you know, a lot of the aggressive male, you see a lot of the passive male who's trying to be the exact opposite of those macho. And I don't know that we need to go down this rabbit hole, but you also see a lot of gay men. Uh, Latin culture produces shitloads of gay men. And it all still goes back, I think, a lot to that mother's making the little boy the prince and, and he's everything and the father's having very little connection and actually raising their sons. So anyway, yeah. I don't know where, all, where we'll go with all of that, but it's just, <laughs> you, you mentioned cultural dynamics and that's, that's what, as an outsider, that's one I see here in Mexico where I live. No, that, that's very cool. To, and I've, I've seen that as well um, a lot with, uh, I was down in Brazil for a while and I, you know, you definitely pick up on the macho culture there, also in Argentina, and um, and you're right. I mean, you, you really nailed it. I wouldn't have been able to explain it, but uh, it's it's certainly a thing, and it's a little bit different um, that I, I've been living, you know, in in Ukraine, Eastern Europe, for the past year and a half, and there is a similar sort of situation where you have absentee fathers who are just, you know, off working you know, guzzling vodka, very few of the girls I know, like a lot of them don't even know who their dad is. Um, yeah. You know, he just picked up and left. Um, and, you know, it, but it's interesting, the, they don't like the, the former Soviet guys don't really have that machismo thing. Um, I don't know what it is. They, they kind of have just more like a drunk, vodka absentee sort of thing <laughs> <laughs> like they just they just don't care but the I, I guess it has something to do with the fact that um it's just uh i think the roles of men and women here i mean it's so it, like communism was, was so far behind the times the women like have very little rights even to this day it's pretty fucked up here you know a woman could go to the police and say hey my boyfriend beat me up and you know, she's got black and blue marks all over her face. And the, the cop will say, well, you know, why'd you go to his house? Yeah. <laughs> what, did, what did you do? You know, it's, exactly. that way here in, it's that way here in Mexico as well. I, uh, you know, uh, b believe me, when I hear American women, college educated, good careers, you know, complaining about all the, the injustice done to them, I'm thinking, come visit a Latin American country, you know, mm -hmm. go to a, an yeah, Eastern to Europe country, you know, <laughs> yeah. go, go, go to, go to one of these countries where women have absolutely no fucking right support or safety net whatsoever. You know, you see, you know, I saw a billboard in Guadalajara a couple of years ago that for, you know, it, it was a, a part of a network of support system for women. And I assume this is accurate. The billboard said that 50% of Mexican girls will be pregnant by their 15th birthday. And, yep. and you know, and you, and you know what, none of the dads that impregnate those girls are ever held accountable for the support of the woman, the child in any way whatsoever. It's not unusual for a man down here to have, you know, seven kids with seven different women. He raises none of them. He supports none of them. So the women kind of just stay in poverty. 
you know, and, yeah. and down here, you know, what man is going to want to get involved with a, a mother that has kids as, as, as considered a liability, all they're seen for is, you know, quick hookups. Oh yeah. She's a single mom. She'll want to have sex, but no, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, make her my girlfriend or wife. Why should I get involved with the woman who has kids? And so it just perpetuates a cycle of poverty for women and the children that they're raising. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I don't know if I want to go down that rabbit hole either, but, but when it comes to, you know, culture that, that truly has abandoned women, you know, in a lot of parts of the world, it, it is still that way. And, and, and these women really do have a legitimate complaint uh, about, you know, the dynamics there. And again, I, and then, then those girls raise their little boys to be, you know, you know, the little prince and the little mama boy, because that gives them status and the cycle just keeps on going. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's so fascinating to, you know, to see how these different cultures play out. And, um, and you know, the thing that I, I find most is being in the line of work that, you know, that I'm in, that you're in, is most of the guys anyways that still come to me still come from, you know, a country that was once, uh, you know, part of the British Empire. You know, very mm -hmm. rarely will I get a Spanish client or a French client or an Italian or a, a Greek guy. These guys, you know, because of that machismo culture, they, you know, well, at least a lot of them seem to have something figured out, or maybe it's just that they refuse to admit it. Um, but it's uh, a lot of it, I think, is perpetuated by that English culture and the, you know, that whole sort of <laughs> chivalrous, nice guy thing that's been, uh, that's been kind of blown over. But I wanted to ask you um you know i feel like since i you know w became aware of the nice guy syndrome um and i've definitely you know changed drastically but i'm always i can always kind of feel it creeping up if i'm not careful yeah so my question is can you ever really cure yourself of the nice guy syndrome or is it always something you have to you know keep on dealing with that's a good question and and uh it's not unusual for men to ask me that when they like first read the book or sign up for a class with me, you know, you know, about how long do you think it'll take? You know, we, we, we men, we, 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 want, get this finished, we, right? we want the schematic. We want the roadmap. Yeah. We, we want the plan. Give me the plan. You know, and I'll, 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 you know, have this done in, in six months. Right. You know, as I said, I've been working on this stuff for 25 years. Um, I've been working with men, you know, I'm, I'm probably the world's authority on nice guy syndrome because I am a nice guy and I probably have worked with more nice guys than anybody on this planet. And, um, and I still see my nice guy tendencies creep up. You know, mm -hmm. I, I mentioned I got married uh, again about be three years ago this November. And, um, you know, I, I'd done a lot of my nice guy work, especially in relationship where mine tends to show up the most. And I found myself slipping into nice guy behaviors with, with my wife of, you know, pleasing and avoiding the conflict and, you know, reacting, you know, to her stuff rather than, you know, just, you know, being firm, keeping my boundaries, you know, making my needs a priority, communicating well. I, 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 sl I was slipping into these passively pleasing, avoidant behaviors and then feeling resentful, all typical nice guy stuff. Yeah. And that, that, that's when I, I went out and got uh, a coach and got into a men's <laughs> program. I thought, oh, okay, I'm never done with this. And right. it was interesting that about two years ago, two and a half years ago, I went to New York to reread for the audible version of No More Mr. Nice Guy. It was originally recorded by a, a professional voice. And a, few, a couple, about three years back, I told my agent, I want to read it. Uh, you know, I want a worldwide distribution. And so um, they, they tore up the old contract and paid me to come to New York to read it. So you're like, I'm reading my book and you know, I, 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 it took me years to write. I've taught it, but I haven't just sat down and read it like in a long time. And so mm -hmm. I'm reading it for the audible version. And as I'm reading it, I'm going uh, kind of like, Oh fuck. Oh shit. Oh, fuck. Right? oh shit. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm back there again. I'm doing, I forgot. And one of the things I say in the book is that nice guys tend to be slow learners and quick forgetters. I say that in the book and I'm thinking, Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, I forgot about that. How did I know that not in the past, but like, I forgot it now. So I, I don't know that we ever get done. Okay. That's yeah. a, that's, that's a masculine thing. What do I need to do to finish this and get done? And then we want everything to be calm and copacetic and no more stuff in life. It's never going to happen. Data talks a lot about that, that masculine yeah. error. Yeah. I think we'll be done and then I can relax and be in peace. No, ain't you're done when you're happen. dead. You're I done when you're dead. Yeah. But, but I, when, 
when when my publisher put out um, kind of a cleaned up version of No More Mr. Nice Guy two years ago, it didn't change anything, just fix some errors and uh, typos and stuff. Um, I wrote a, a foreword for it about what I had, about my life and what I'd learned about nice guys in the last 15 years since the book was published. And I, I pretty much concluded the, the forward that I wrote that re recovery from the nice guy syndrome is not about becoming good. It's not about becoming a better man. Uh, it's really about becoming more you, more me, um, learning to love me, learning to accept me, learning to celebrate me. Because nice guys have been trying, as I said earlier to you, either trying to figure out what I have to become to make other people happy and get my needs met, get love and get laid and hide anything about myself that keeps me, you know, from getting my needs met and, and getting love and getting laid. So we're not ourselves. And, and, and in, in the book, that's what I talk about. Nice guys are, are inherently not nice because we're not being honest. We're not being authentic. We're not being our true self. We're not being integrated. So really, when I talk about nice guy recovery, in some ways, even though I use the word recovery a lot, I'm, I, I, it's not the best word. I use it. Um, but, but Maybe getting what, closer to authenticity or something. Yeah. What are we really recovering from? We're recovering from something that we inaccurately internalized, we thought would be necessary to survive, to, to get love. Right. To get bad behavior. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sort of bad but, uh, behavior. You know, tendencies or, or yeah so so yeah. even, even while we're trying to be, yeah. right even while we're trying to be good those things we're trying to do to be good actually make us inauthentic and often not so nice so um in terms of you know yeah this this lifetime journey how about we we phrase this how about we spend the rest of our life learning to know ourselves love ourselves accept ourselves more completely and that means we we can accept our dark side. We can accept our imperfections. We can accept our toxic masculinity. We can accept we're more like our dads than different. We can accept that sometimes we have rage and resentment towards women and, and aren't so nice to them. If we can actually just begin to look and accept, and, and that's where I think, again, tribe, yeah, I keep coming back to it. Our tribe can help us because like you say you're, you're, you're doing work with, with a brother. It doesn't matter if it's in 12 step program, pick up, um, you know, mankind project, divorce recovery, whatever. You'll see things in your brother that you don't have judgment of. You'll see it as a flaw, an imperfection, something he struggles with, but you don't judge him. You don't criticize him. You, you don't, you're not down on him, but yet we'll judge the same thing in ourselves and we'll be critical of ourselves for the same thing. So that's where our tribe can help us learn to, to love and, and, support and encourage and hold accountable our brothers as they teach us to do the same. And, you know, we need to be accountable. We, we, we need to bring our darkness out into the open so it doesn't kind of, you know, slip out, sneak out, ooze out in ways that like are hurtful and destructive. And that's what our brothers are for. But the main part of that is, is just learning to love and like and accept and embrace who we are as we are in this particular moment. We don't have to lose weight. We don't have to make more money. We don't have to get better looking. We don't have to, we don't have to change a goddamn thing of who we are in this moment to just be okay with ourselves. I, yeah, I, I agree completely. And uh, <laughs> it's, I, I wanted to ask you a, a more personal question. Um, I love personal questions. I, I <laughs> Yeah, I'll too. talk so, about anything. Very cool. So it's about monogamy. And when you obviously your first relationship, you mentioned how, you know, you, the, your, uh, your wife was withholding sex, or she just wasn't interested in sex because of your behavior. Um, I had a relationship like that. And it totally just drove me crazy, because it was the first relationship i had ever had where that was the case. Mm -hmm. And when I now it was obvious what happened, I slipped back into my total just you know pathetic and authentic nice guy patterns because she was like the the greatest you know the you know the most beautiful girl i'd ever dated at the time right, and right. Uh, i was like oh i gotta keep her i gotta make her happy and right. then realized later like oh my god this is this was a total she, screw up she, she didn't want to fuck that passively pleasing little boy right not at all but my solution to it was so fucked up 
because I went through all the dating and the pickup stuff and I became this kind of, I don't know, player, if you will. So my solution to her not wanting to have sex with me was to go out and fuck other girls, mm -hmm. which was, <laughs> which was hey, kind of that's, that's, that's great male <laughs> logic, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so I'm not really sure what my question is, but um, that, you know, when you told your story that, that um, you know, that it brought up that subject. But I guess my question is, you know, when you were, you know, between marriages or whatever, um, you know, did you ever have a, you know, crazy wild side or, you know, yeah, did I you did. Ever... <laughs> when, <laughs> Those... You know, there's, there's probably several questions in your question. Uh, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll try to briefly answer a few of them. Sure. Um, my first two wives were the first two women I had sex with. Um, I'd kind of messed around as a teenager and touched boobies and stuff like that. But you know, intercourse, my, my first wife was the first woman that, that I had intercourse with. And then I had an affair with my second wife, the woman who I married while I was married to my first wife. Um, so I went straight from that relationship to the second. So she became the second woman that I had intercourse with. And so by the time I got divorced in my um, late 40s, um, I was pretty really inexperienced. Um, yeah. even though I kind of had this nice guy image, of, I'm, I'm a good lover. Cause you know, I, <laughs> I take care of the needs of the woman, but you know, um, my second wife rarely wanted to have sex with me. And, and even though it began as an affair and she was highly sexual on our wedding night or not our wedding night, but honeymoon, she said, aren't you glad that now that we're married, we don't have to pretend to like sex anymore. And I thought, oh, I, I, I wasn't pretending, but you know, I'm such a nice guy. I didn't like confront that in that moment and say, wait a minute, we need to have a, a come to yeah. Jesus meeting here. We need to have a heart to heart. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. I stayed with her 14 more years. Um, and so, but that, that was just true, nice guy stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And then throughout the marriage, you know, even as I started doing my own therapy work and personal growth work, she kept saying, well, if you were just this, I'd, I'd want to have more sex. Or if you just weren't that way, if you did that. And, you know, after 14 years of me, like, transforming who I was as a man and her being still the same person with the same resistance after 14 years. I thought, wait a minute, I'm changing. She's not. There's something wrong with this picture. And, and I did go through what I call my integrated man whore stage when, when I was single. Um, and and I that like is that definition, integrated man. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I didn't create any illusions with women. They, they, mm -hmm. they all knew, you know, I wasn't, when I wasn't monogamous, they knew I wasn't. Um, I wasn't so much trying to be, you know, open, polyamorous. What? It's just that I've been married for 25 years to two women, and they were my first two sex partners, and I wasn't in a big hurry just to, like, get locked down all over again into another long-term relationship. I, I wanted to experience. It wasn't that I wanted to have a ton of sex. In fact, I was kind of struggling with, with you know, some ED issues at that time. So it wasn't like this was all about me getting laid. I just wanted to have a lot of different experiences and, and kind of learn about life and experience different women. Um, so so I, I did sleep with a, a number of women. I, I tell the story at times of sleeping with four different women in one weekend. Um, and all of them knew I wasn't monogamous to them. Um, and they had varying stages of okayness with that, but they still wanted to fuck me. Um, but they all knew the truth. I wasn't monogamous. I wasn't seeing just them. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I tried to be as authentic about that as I could. And what, what, what's funny, I'll, I'll often say that my first two wives, after our marriages ended because of, you know, my first marriage, 10 years, second marriage, 14 years of me being this toxic, nice guy, um, neither of my first two wives wanted to talk to me for years after our, I was divorced from them. I mean, that's, it's been cleared up, you know, I, I made amends with both and, and um, it's not that we chat, but, you know, we don't hate each other with either. But when I was being more authentic with women and living life on my terms, is that the majority of the women I dated during that 12, 15 year period of being single, um, stayed friends with me, stayed, liked me afterwards, still thought I was a great guy, still wanted to come around occasionally and fuck me. So it was funny when I was being more authentic, um, the women kept thinking I was a decent guy. When I was being this unauthentic, nice guy, those women didn't want to talk to me for years afterwards. Now, in yeah. terms of monogamy, here's my opinion. And, and what I found out about me during that integrated man horse stage is that I, 
it was kind of validating that women wanted me. I had women propositioning me, getting naked with me on first dates without me even like trying to make anything happen. I had women telling me, I don't, I don't want to date. I just want to get laid. You know, let's go. Um, I thought, what planet have I landed on? <laughs> that was not my, that was not my worldview of myself or of women. Um, but that, that changed uh, that worldview. But what I learned about me is, is I didn't really like fucking around. Um, it, it didn't really fulfill me. I didn't really enjoy the sex all that much. It was still, uh, it's still in some ways me being a nice guy of accommodating the woman because she wanted to fuck. And I didn't want to say no or pass up those opportunities because I hadn't had many in my lifetime. But I, once I got enough of that, I realized, you know, I, I, I like being sexual with somebody that I've got a deeper sense of connection with. And so since that time, that's the route I've gone. Now, in terms of monogamy, my opinion is, is that as humans, we're not wired for monogamy. I think that's kind of a, a socially, religiously imposed dynamic on us humans that doesn't work. <laughs> you know, just look around. It does not work. Um, it really we're not wired to, to be exclusively sexual with one person for life. And back when that, that, that idea came around, a lifetime maybe was 14 or 23, you know. So right. a, a lifetime of sex with one person wasn't that out of the question. Um, Have you read uh, Sex at Dawn? I've read Sex at Dawn. Um, yeah, and that's, that's highly influenced kind of my view is that mm -hmm. probably for our first million and a half to two million years, we humans were communal. We shared everything. Um, and, and that means that uh, sex was communal. All the men mm -hmm. fucked all the women. If you think about it, that's the way Mother Nature wants it. And, and actually, I don't even buy into kind of this... Um, uh, social biology kind of viewpoint that, you know, the whole hypergamy, the women are wired to go pick the strongest man who can best support her and her kids, blah, blah, blah. I actually don't think that's part of human history. I think that only started occurring in the last 10,000 years, more in our patriarchal model, where men right. started owning everything, including sure. their wives and kids. And mm -hmm. in that situation, because sex and everything else was no longer communal, women had to start competing with each other to get to get their needs met. And so they would go compete for, you know, the, the, the highest status men. But I don't think that's part of our, our human evolution. I think that was actually imposed on women in the last 10,000 years by this uh, agricultural ownership, you know, patriarchal model. So yeah, I agree completely. It, in, in my experience, no, we are not wired to be monogamous. And I believe that consciously approaching monogamy is one of the most powerful personal growth machines available to us humans. My wife and I are monogamous. And we, we have an agreement that all of our sexual energy stays within the container of our marriage. We don't flirt with anybody else. I don't have any women on my Facebook page. Um, she doesn't flirt with men. I don't fantasize, I don't look at porn. I don't masturbate unless she's with me or unless I'm making a video of it while I'm traveling to share with her. Every <laughs> ounce of my sexual energy stays within that, that container. She, like most women, especially most Latina women, has tremendous abandonment issues. Every man she's ever known has been a serial cheater. Um, she sees women kind of you know, fucking other women over, fucking with their men, just because women tend to do that to each other. Um, and so she's got big trust issues. So us having this monogamous container allows her to, to work on her trust issues, release her fears, open up more completely. And she's a, she is just the most open sex crazed woman I've ever been with. She loves having sex with me. She says she was never that way in the past. Um, and she can tell me the darkest, nastiest fantasies while we're being sexual. She just lets her mind go. And it's everything that she's actually afraid of what could happen out there in the real world, right? But she'll create fantasies because in this container where all of our sexual energy stays there, you, we, we can put all of our fantasies. We can tell each other every dark story you could possibly think of every possible scenario that could happen in the real world sexually we share that with each other in that container so in a sense it's kind of like we're never fucking the same person twice in a row our sex is always different and always vibrant and energetic and spontaneous um and it, and so i think that mimics perhaps what are what humans were wired for 
you know, million years ago is, is to have all kinds of different sexual experience. We all do, we do, my wife and I do that within the container of a monogamous relationship. And I find that amazingly fulfilling in ways that I didn't find sleeping around. Yeah, it's um, the way you're describing it almost sounds a bit like a spiritual practice in the sense of, yeah, I could fuck around, but it's, you know, it's empowering to know that I'm not taking that liberty, even though yeah. I could, it doesn't mean that I should, um, or it doesn't mean that it's going to make me happier. Because I think a lot of, a, a lot of that stuff, at least for me, around sleeping with other women and going out was, it was trying to get a need met that wasn't really being met. It was like trying to scratch an itch that wasn't. <laughs> yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I, mostly it was my need to be needed and my want to be wanted had nothing to do with sex. Uh, right. And then, I, I call that, you know, the whole looking for love in all the wrong places. Oh, this woman <laughs> wants to have sex with me. That, that means I am fill in the blank, right? I'm good. I'm valuable. I'm lovable. I'm desirable. And then when you're done having sex with her, you go, actually, I don't feel any more lovable, desirable, <laughs> or good. I, I, I was looking for something to fill an emptiness, to scratch an itch that was totally unrelated. And that's why it didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I certainly, I mean, Last year, 2018, I slept with more women than I ever had, almost like one new one a week. It was just totally out of control. Mm -hmm. And I found myself the most unhappy I'd ever been also. You know, God, was go like, okay, I had a, yeah, who knew? <laughs> That's so, when I, so maybe I did have a sex addiction, but I don't you think You need to go to a 12 step group, man. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so you, you, had, you had pussy on the pedestal and you found out it wasn't the answer to what ailed you. I, I did. <laughs> it was an expensive lesson with a lot of, uh, a lot of trips and a lot of parties and, and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, and every, my friends who were close to me, they're like, Oh, you're definitely a sex. I like, but I'm like, I don't really care about the sex. It's not about the sex. It was about, you Isn't know, the funny? power of getting this girl to want to have sex with me. And then as soon as yeah. she wanted to, I was like, yeah, okay, great. Yeah. But you know, I'll do it. I'll have the sex, but yeah, it was totally unfulfilling. So. Yeah, honestly, yeah. the majority of women I've had sex with, I had sex with them not because I was dying to fuck them. I had sex with them because they were available and let me let me know that they wanted to have sex. And it's kind of like, as I said, well, yeah, well, I'm a guy. Why would I pass up that opportunity? But it mm -hmm. wasn't because I was dying to fuck them. It, it's kind of an interesting dynamic. It, it, right. It sounds it's like, like you, you don't want to miss out. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to miss out on this. You know, she's right. standing there naked. Why, why wouldn't I? But I don't want to kick myself later, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at least for me, I think a lot of that came from so many years being, you know, a, a frustrated teenager and a frustrated guy in my early 20s where I just couldn't get any. And hearing, you know, I, I had a girl write in my senior year, high school yearbook, like, Oh, I had the biggest crush on you, but you know, you never made a move. And, and you're going, ah. and I'm like, ah. right. So when I when I figured out how to actually, you know, drop my inauthentic, a lot of the nice guy behavior and women started to like me, I was like, all right, I can never miss an opportunity again. I don't want that regret. Yeah. And then it just spiraled out of control. Well, <laughs> yeah, well you later. you yeah. and I are talking about, you know, shared experience. And and since I went through that in, in my late forties. And early 50s so I, I was you know probably older than a lot of men that, that, that do if they do have that I highly recommend it I highly recommend having an integrated man horse stage I yeah. think it's actually a good idea that because of what you and I both found out if you don't go through this you live in a fantasy world of what it would be like right mm -hmm. you get with a good woman and maybe she's a great woman and maybe you're satisfied with her and like the sex but you keep thinking what would it be like to fuck her what would it be like to fuck that woman what would it be like to fuck that woman i see over there and you live in that constant fantasy world of what if what would it be like what would it be like but if you actually let yourself go through it and walk through every door and fuck every woman that's willing to get naked with you and i've come to find out you know that's not that hard to do. Women really are wired to like sex, to want a lot of, want a lot of sex and to enjoy it more than we men. Um, and I think you need to go through that to kill the fantasy that, Oh, it, it's like actually going to fix something inside or mm -hmm. satisfy something inside. And then you just realize actually all that did was just like you say, cost me a lot of money, uh, <laughs> took up, a, right. took up a lot of time. Um, you know, created a lot of weird scenarios um, <laughs> and I, I don't actually feel any better. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think you got to go through it. And 
um, I, again, I'm not, I'm not against open relationship. I'm not against uh, polyamorous relationships. I'm not against swingers. Everybody's got to find out what works for them. Um, but I think a guy needs to at least have had that experience of knowing they got good at getting women in order to, to decide if that works for them or not. So they don't just live in yeah. that ongoing fantasy about it. Yeah. That's so important because otherwise it's, you just have your mind. I mean, I've been in my first relationships, just always, you know, and it turns out those girls were amazing. And yeah. I was just never present with them because I was always thinking about, Oh, well, what if I could have this or what if I could have what that? If? What yeah, if? What? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Looking back. So those were actually some of the most healthy, best relationships that I had were my relationships in my early twenties, you know, my high school one and first college, two long-term relationships of, you know, a year and, and four years almost. And then I got into all the pickup stuff and, you know, started chasing strippers and, and, you know. <laughs> well, of course you got to chase some strippers. You know. yeah, of course, why, yeah. why wouldn't you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, through, through the experience and going through the integrated man horse stage, as you say, it was, um, you know, you come to realize, all right, that, you know, I did it. It was cool. And yeah. not got some such stories a, to tell. Yeah. But yeah. Did, did it make you happier or make your life better? Eh, who knows? It's like one of those things, right? You, you, you want to tell your little brother, oh, you don't need to do that because it's not going to make you happy. But then you're like, no, actually, you do need to do that to realize it won't make you happy. But me telling you that doesn't help you at all. Yeah. I oh, I think it. every guy's got to do it. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what cautionary tales you and I tell. Um, no, I, I think a person should, again, just just go dive into their darkness. Go Go dive into whatever you need to dive into and, and, you know, until you come out the other side of that and find out what works for you. And cause mm -hmm. what works for me and what works for you might not work for the, you know, uh, every guy listening to this, but go find out, go find out yeah. what works for you. Go do it consciously. And that's why I called it an integrated man horse stage. I tried to do that as consciously as possible. You know, I tried to be very clear with women. You know, I, I, I wasn't exclusive you know, I practiced safe sex. You know, I, I was, I was just, I didn't let them spend the night with me. You know, I, I was just very, very authentic and integrated about it that we're just having sex. You know, everybody's clear on that. That's all this is. We're having sex. We might enjoy each other again next week. We might not, but this is just all that it is. And, um, and so be, be very authentic about it. Don't, don't create any false illusions. I know it's probably a, a, a double term. Uh, illusions are false, but don't create false <laughs> illusions with women. Um, if you're into her, let her know you're into her. If you're just having sex because you want to have sex with her, you don't have to sit down and have a big spiel about that. But don't create any illusions that you know you love her or that you want her to be your girlfriend. Yeah, that's so true. And um, you know, the I got to the point where, like, the more honest I was about how big of a you know fuck boy I was, basically, mm -hmm. the more you know women wanted to sleep with me because like I just want to find a guy I can fuck yeah. no big deal like thanks for being yeah. honest about it and we're raised in a culture that's so against that and you know well, especially I, a religious environment that sounds like you grew up in yeah uh, and um you know it turns out that's kind of what women want in the first place they just want a guy who's honest with, with his intentions and and not afraid to be like yeah I'm a fuck boy like let's fuck well I I tell guys you know this is something I learned through that I tell especially nice guys you know we think well I'll go real slow hide my sexual agenda little woman get to know what a great guy I am you know and, and then maybe she'll want to show me your tits you know it, that 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 is actually so inauthentic and mm -hmm. I tell guys what I found out is is women don't fuck a guy because they've gotten to know him they get to know the guy they want to fuck so, right. you know, women have to kind of go through that little bit of a cultural thing that, uh, oh, tell me a little bit about you. Okay, now let's take her clothes off, you know. But we have this, this kind of cultural thing that women don't like sex and think men who want sex are bad. And I found out that is as far from the truth as it could possibly be, that, that women are biologically wired to want to fuck a lot often and be fucked well. It's... It's in their evolutionary wiring. Totally. It, it, yeah. It's we men that have put a big lid on that um, by yeah. you know, the slut shaming, the burkas, the chastity belts, you know, the scarlet letters, the stoning. You know, so like if women are like so non-sexual, why do we have to stone them? 
You know, why, why do right. we have to cover them with a burqa? Why do we have to put them in a chastity belt? You know, why do we have to put a, a scarlet A on their forehead? If they're not that sexual, why do we have to, why do we men keep trying to put a big lid on it? Um, <laughs> yeah, if, if, and, and it was me, it was me going through my integrated man horse stage that let me find that out. Is it women like to, to be fucked and like to be fucked well and often? And okay, you know, that's, that's a good thing to know. Yeah, it, it, well, what you said reminds me of a part of the sex at dawn piece where they're talking about female orgasms. Mm -hmm. You know, why is a female orgasm loud and screaming and versus a male orgasm, which is just like, oh, right. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and his, his, uh, his point is it's, it's to basically tell other men like, look, I'm available. Come fuck yeah. me too. Line and, up. Uh, yeah. And, and, and also, I think I add to that, I think it was maybe the original hot or not uh, social media is that they also let the other women know who was a good fuck, who wasn't. Right. <laughs> Third party validation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, shit, man, this has been uh, super awesome. I don't, I don't know if I have any more questions. I, uh, <laughs> oh, we've got, we've I talked about everything. We've covered it all. Yeah, man. Um, so tell us more, you know, where can guys find you, uh, pick up your book and learn about your trainings? Okay. Uh, I got two websites. One is drglover.com where they can find out about everything I do, where it's got my online classes at my online university, my workshops, my seminars. Uh, my other website, uh, newer one is datingessentialsformen.com. That's the name of my most recent book that as we talk, we're in uh, August of 2019, Dating Essentials for Men came out two months ago uh, in June. Uh, so they can go to Amazon and get either Dating Essentials for Men or No More Mr. Nice Guy. So those are the two websites. And if they just Google No More Mr. Nice Guy or Google Robert Glover, I come up in all the top spaces. So I'm pretty easy to find. Awesome. Um, and I was looking on your site and it looks like what accompanies um, the dating essentials for men. There's like an ongoing program with that as well, right? Yeah, I've got a bone. I call it a bonus bundle for the dating mm -hmm. essentials for men. And all that information is on the dating essentials for men uh, website that, that basically is, is a package of, of a bunch of goodies. A lot of it came out of when I taught dating essentials for men is, is for online courses for about 10 years. So um, you, you get an uh, annotated searchable version of, Dating Essentials for Men. You get what I call a Dating Essentials for Men A to Z encyclopedia that has like quest answers to over 200 questions I got asked during those times. There's like 25 plus hours of recorded Q&A. Um, my 10 best-selling Dating Essentials for Men Q&A podcasts and a private Facebook group and uh, monthly group coaching calls with me. Um, so this is a pretty good little bundle if, if guys really do want to get good with women. Uh, yeah. So they can find that all at datingessentialsformen.com. Very cool. And uh, no, it's been, it's been so awesome having you on and uh, getting to hear some of these uh, more personal things about you. And, uh, and it, it, a real honor. Thanks so much for coming on. Robbie, thank you for the invitation. It was fun to talk to you and, and uh, look forward to bumping into you again in the near future. Thanks for listening. If you want more, go to innerconfidence.com and don't forget to subscribe to this podcast for the latest episodes.